Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jessica Nolan. I am a member of the Education for Justice Advisory Board and a faculty member in the Psychology Department. I'm so pleased to be with you tonight and to have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Robert Kraft. As many of you know, this year's Education for Justice theme is sustainable memory. Our goal in selecting the theme was to understand how we as individuals, families, communities, and nations develop practices of remembering and commemorating that reflect a sustainable mindset, that create memory in just, responsible ways. I believe the talk Dr. Kraft has planned for us tonight will not only meet, but exceed this goal. Dr. Kraft is a professor of cognitive psychology at Otterbein University. He's an accomplished scholar who has published both scholarly articles and books on the topic of memory for traumatic events. Dr. Kraft's talk tonight will be based on his 2002 book, Memory Perceived, Recalling the Holocaust. This book uses oral testimonies to document how memory responds to atrocity, how people comprehend and remember deeply traumatic experiences, and how they ultimately adapt. Yale University archivist Joanne Rudolph says that Dr. Kraft's book provides a new paradigm for understanding the impact of the Holocaust, both on individuals and for society as a whole. We are eagerly awaiting the arrival of his new book, Violent Accounts, which analyzes the testimony of violent perpetrators <coughs> and the confrontations between victims and perpetrators during South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Doc Dr. Krauss' research shows that what survivors remember and how they remember it shapes their lives and the lives of those with whom they come in contact. As such, Dr. Krauss' talk promises um, both to help us keep alive the memories of those who survived the Holocaust, but also to inform our understanding of how shared memories continue to influence the lives of the survivors and can be used to educate others. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Kraft. Thank you, thank you. That was very nice. Uh, good evening. Come, come on, good evening. Good evening. So, so I know it's not a rock concert. But it's, uh, I want to thank Professor Nolan and the Education for Justice program for inviting me to your beautiful campus with its distinctive architecture, and it, and it really is, um, and for allowing me to meet you and to talk to you. I, uh, I think I've talked to, to some of you. I recognize a few faces. I also know that some of you are here because of incentives and I, I appreciate that as well. I, I hope to make this worthwhile. I, and I appreciate the weather. I think this is a good evening to be inside. Uh, fewer temptations. I, I should begin. Are there any questions about any of the material that I've covered so far? Because this is a class. This is a formal talk, but I would like you to treat it informally. Feel free to walk out, honestly. I don't, I don't mind when people walk out, it's only when they start coming towards me <laughs> that I get, I get nervous. Um, my topic this evening is memory for the Holocaust. As a psychologist, I study oral testimony from people who lived through the Holocaust to learn about memory uh, and its profound influence on people who have lived through extended atrocity. My plan this evening is to present general patterns of memory with specific examples, just to give you an idea, uh, that emerged from very close study of Holocaust testimony. And the focus is not on the Holocaust itself as an historical event, but the psychological responses of survivors of extended atrocity. I'll try to make eye contact with you every so often. Um, my hope is that these findings will generalize, unfortunately, uh, to other groups of people who have gone through extended trauma in Cambodia, in Rwanda, in Guatemala, in Darfur, in Indonesia, and elsewhere. There is, sadly, no shortage of application for contemporary research on traumatic memory. One motivating question this evening, I, I think you've heard this already this, this semester, is, is Holocaust memory sustainable? Uh, and what does that question even mean? I, I hope 
while I'm talking, because I know attention can be divided and that's the way it should be, I hope you're thinking about this question as I'm talking. Um, and I will offer some interpretations, at least indirectly, and I will ask the question again. To begin, I would like to present some brief excerpts of testimony from people who lived through the Holocaust. This is oral testimony from people who lived through the Holocaust and decades later they sat down in front of a video camera and gave spontaneous free recall, just remembered, of these long past events 40, 50, 60 years earlier. Starting, they st started collecting these in the 1980s and are collecting them today. Ch mostly child survivors are giving testimony. Uh, and in this way, with these examples that I'm about to give, I would like each of us to begin to construct inductively a theory of traumatic memory, uh, building a theory of memory. So I'll start with some quotations. And I'll give the name of the person, not the last name, and uh, just a, a brief excerpt. Start with Alex H. Quote, for when I look at my children, my grandchild, and I remember what happened to children like them. Sometimes there comes a picture before my eyes and it is so real that I could touch it. Hedda K, quote, I can see pictures like in a movie. I can see details, but there is no connection. Solomon M, memories are there all the time, all the time. Isabella L, we arrived to some insane planet, the kind of which no one has ever seen. It was the sky was black, thick, smelly, stinking, smoke, the burning of human fat. For those who think it happened long ago, it happened yesterday. Sally H. So these things stay with you. It's something you don't forget. You see the trucks. You see the babies. You see the screaming mothers. You see hanging people. You sit and you see that face there. It's something you don't forget. <coughs> Hannah F. I don't remember what I did yesterday. I can put my washcloth in the refrigerator. But the other days, the other years, and the weeks, and everybody else is right in front of me. I go to sleep with it. I get up with it. Irene W. For some reason, I could not get any tears. Why weren't we screaming maniacs at that point, those of us who saw it daily? Zoltan G. You was indifferent to everything. You was like a vegetable. I didn't care. I didn't care if they would kill me in a minute. Celia K. There wasn't one tear in me. There weren't any emotions at all. You couldn't hate. You couldn't feel. Jacob K., over four decades later. The tortures days and nights. It's something that we have. It's in our mind. You can't forget that. I couldn't even tell you, describe one day in the ghetto. I don't want to live with that pain. But it's there. It's there. It forms its own entity and it surfaces whenever it wants to. I go on a train and I will cry. I will read something and I'll be right back there where I came from and I can't erase it. I'm not asking for it. It comes by itself. Martin S., nearly 50 years after the events. I think the problem is, I'm afraid if I open it up, I'm going to have nightmares that I had for years and years, and I will not allow this. I'm afraid it might destroy me. Sally H., time makes it even worse. Eva B., 44 years later, it's going to be there until the day I die. It's more painful, it's more alive rather than less so. Jolie Z. is asked what prevents survivors from talking about their experiences. She replies, quote, the very scale, the very magnitude, it's unimaginable. You know what? Sometimes I don't believe it anymore. I sometimes ask myself, was it possible? How can anybody believe it if I question it? After three and a half hours of testimony, Leo G. says, this is what you got from me. On other occasions, I might tell you more. Carl S., a child survivor, very young, three or four years old, when he, during the Holocaust, I personally feel I am a successful professional in my field as a technician, but as a person, I feel I'm sitting on a volcano. Finally, a quotation from Joanne Rudolph, whom we've already heard from, uh, the archivist of these testimonies and an historian, uh, quote, it is amazing to me how consistently correct people's memories are. She compares what people say to 
documented historical events. My research takes place, took place at um, Yale University in the Fortunoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. It's a unique collection of more than 4,000 oral testimonies and growing slowly, recorded from all over the world. Uh, testimonies range from 40 minutes to eight hours, but most are around two hours, and then people have to stop recalling. My work involved the oral testimony of more than 130 people who, gave, who were victims of Nazi ghettos and concentration camps. Uh, they came from 12 different European countries, varying in language, economic background, religiousness, and level of education. They ranged in age from infancy to 43 when World War II started, and from 40 to 95 when giving testimony. In fact, this oldest person said, very, was very clear, he said he's 95 and a half. It's important to him. Uh, people conscripted into the community of loss, no matter where, are a very diverse group. Uh, it's helpful to think of them that way. It's not one kind of person. Uh, these survivors gave testimony uh, with the perspective of having lived with their memories for at least four decades, some 50, 60 years. I believe oral testimony is the most direct and immediate way to learn about the human experience of historical atrocities. Thoughts, emotions, personal events in vivid detail, information that cannot be gathered from documents or represented in statistics or even depicted in film. How else do we discover the detailed misery of Hannah H. as she hides in a rat-infested cellar, absorbed in thoughts of suicide, thinking about her sister, her parents, her husband, her baby, all killed in front of her, and Hannah running away from each murder. Gampiero Carocci, in the book The Officer's Camp, calls this knowledge little history. Hannah H. describes her transport to the ghetto, quote, it took us several days to get to Lodge. It's a large city in Poland. I don't remember how long. I remember these horrible screams because they always, they used to come from outside in to the wagons and they slammed the doors and sometimes they hurt the people's fingers. And this was the first time I heard people screaming with pain. The historically inconsequential detail of fingers painfully smashed is a point of entrance for all of us to begin to understand these widespread atrocities, at least partially. I think we can all understand that. Oral testimony collected by an archive is especially suited, I think, for studying memory. Uh, people can engage in uninterrupted recall without an outline. They talk without an imposed structure. At the end of her testimony, Magda F. summarizes her efforts. Quote, I did not read notes. It just came by itself, the way I remember it. During the, the recording of one testimony, it happened to be with the son of the survivor. I was out of sight in the control room, and uh, we were both listening to the son's father's testimony, and the son became agitated. He started pacing around the room, and within five minutes he said, this is not what we came to talk about. Why is he talking about this? Uh, most survivors of atrocity are more likely to reveal guarded information to a prepared stranger, to an interviewer, than to friends or even family. And many survivors are reluctant historians, resisting the giving of testimony until many years after the events, and sometimes never. The most pervasive finding in my study of Holocaust testimony is the extraordinary persistence of memory. I don't know if there's anything else organic like this in nature. Specific memories can remain vivid and powerful for more than 50 years, causing people to cry suddenly a half a century later, to break down uncontrollably, to become angry. <coughs> Core memories can remain accurate and unchanged over very long periods of time, although interpretations may change. Memories can intrude unbidden and unwanted and powerfully into the consciousness of the individual. 
while recalling people can become immersed in memory, lost in the events of the past. <coughs> Memories of long past events can influence present behavior right now without awareness of this influence. That happens in, in, in many people. Uh, recent memories do not weaken or conceal older memories of atrocity, and time does not diminish its potency. Recalling traumatic events does not reduce emotional pain. Why do Holocaust memories endure with such tenacity and power? Probably several reasons. I'll list four reasons. Uh, one reason that seems obvious, I think, is that the routine existence of survivors during the Holocaust stands apart clearly from any other set of memories, even of painful memories. Irene W. says, quote, there is a division, sort of a schizophrenic division or a compartmentalization of what happened, and it's kept tightly separated, and yet it isn't. Isabella L. states flatly, I am not like you. You have one vision of life. I have two. We have double lives that we cannot cancel out. I can talk to you, and I'm not only here, but I see Mengele, I see the crematorium, and I see all of that. Listen to just a few phrases the survivors use. A double existence, another world, a schizophrenic division, two worlds, two different planets, double lives. In mo most cases, unlike normal memories, even of painful events, Holocaust memories are not integrated into the survivor's sense of self. They stand apart as defining another self at another time in another place. And this duality exists for places that were sites of past atrocities. In an article on the genocide in Rwanda, one of the survivors explains that when he looks at a soccer field in his village today, he thinks about the massacre that occurred in that field, but when others look at it, he says, they think about soccer. A second reason for the endurance of memory is the encased emotion, which I'll talk about a little later. Emotion resides in the memory, keeping it alive and powerful. It's encapsulated in the memory. <coughs> also, a third reason, not knowing the outcome of specific events, and this happens with every widespread atrocity. Not knowing the outcome, not knowing what happened to particular people, sustains memories. The uncertainty encourages imagination and extrapolation. Leo B. interrogates the intolerable unknown of his family's death, quote, perished. How? What way? I don't know. The inescapable uncertainty from mass destruction has other entailments which I think we can relate to, along with the violation, anybody who's been traumatized, along with the violation of basic beliefs about self-worth, about justice, about invulnerability, which are gone, the laws of probability were also violated, which are, I think, the most dependable laws on earth. Survivors wonder what was, what might have been, what will be. They know better than to believe in what Milan Kundera, the writer, refers to as the noisy foolishness of human certainties. Finally, survivors remember to preserve the existence of those who were murdered. To forget is to kill again. To remember is to preserve. So the memories are, are unique. There is the emotion, there's the uncertainty, and then there's the desire to remember. One question that must be addressed that's right now is, why is the Holocaust so difficult and other atrocities so difficult to comprehend? Why, what is it about the Holocaust and human understanding that may preclude understanding? Although my research is primarily about memory, it's also about learning. How do we learn about these otherworldly atrocities? How can we learn about the Holocaust? In many testimonies, the survivor states emphatically that the listener will not understand. One survivor, Leo G., I've mentioned him, presented over three hours of testimony in 1980 and then returned for a second testimony eight years later, another long testimony. Even so, during his second testimony, Leo G. makes the following statement. 
I still believe it can't be told. They might hear it and sympathize with it and believe it, but not understand it. He continues by telling the interviewers that if they listen to him for a while and they tell him they understand, then they, and they have no more questions, then they do not understand. And if they do have questions, and if they do not understand, he will tell them more. And if he tells them more, then they will need more questions. And so on. Which invokes the fundamental paradox of learning anything discussed by Plato in the Mino. Learning consists of relating new information to old. That's how we learn assimilating new information into prior knowledge. But if something is truly new, it does not relate to prior knowledge by definition. Therefore, cannot be learned. The Holocaust, according to survivors, is something truly new. And yet, many of the survivors uh, who lived through the Holocaust did find a way at least to try to survive. They understood enough to try to survive. They understood enough to try to tell us after many years of silence. By the way, one of my favorite tropes or figures of speech is paradox, and, and I hope there is enough paradox in this to keep people engaged. The primary unit of testimony is the episode. It's a discrete event with a start and a finish. It's a small story. The basic elements of the episode are vivid perceptual images, deeply felt emotions, and actual physiological experiences. Martin S. summarizes the structure of his thinking, quote, I just know episodes, specifics. That comes back to mind repeatedly. Clemens L. agrees, quote, only very highly charged painful memories are with me, specific memories. The memories are perceived. There are strong visual images and the survivors make direct reference to these images. The episodes are then constructed from these perceptual images with the interpretation of the images being a separate process. Sometimes this is directly apparent. Here's an informative quotation. Sally H. tells of a boy at the Skarzitsko labor camp who stole a belt from a machine he was working with so he could use the leather to cushion his wooden shoes. His feet were bleeding. The boy was caught and then he was hanged for his crime. And Sally was forced to witness this hanging along with the other inmates of Skarzitsko. Quote, at the time, I thought it was a man because I was young. The older I get, the younger that face looks. It was a boy. And we had to watch this. We had to watch that boy being hanged. So the visual image of the face stays constant, but the interpretation changes. The testimony reveals two levels of memory. Core memory, core memory, and narrative memory. Core memory, and we each have these whenever we form memories, core memory is the elemental representation of the original phenomenal experience in the form of visual images, sounds, smells, tastes, emotions, bodily sensations. Narrative memory is then constructed based on these images and core memory and then shaped in a, often shaped in accordance with narrative conventions, uh, once upon a time, or, or the use of archetypes. Those who give testimony usually draw on narrative memory, and their testimony is structured and coherent. It's very unsettling, but we can understand it. It's, it they're just a series of small stories. However, sometimes when describing a scene, survivors may be drawn into the original core memory. The outside world dissolves, and the survivors become immersed in visualizing the events. When a person is fully visualizing, or back there, as the survivors often say, the images are conveyed in raw form, unstructured and impressionistic. And testimony can seem disjointed, just a series of words, of powerful words. In terms of subjective experience, back there refers to a type of consciousness, I think, similar to hypnagogic sleep. 
uh, with the images of memory possessing the fierce vividness of dreams. After an hour of testimony, Jolie Z says, quote, I'm sure we're guided by inner needs to see or deny things around us, um, but um, she shakes her head and looks around for five seconds. I lost my thought. I'm, I'm back there, she gestures with her finger. I'm, I'm just back there. Jolie describes what she sees, mud and just gray and mud. She shakes her head, mm, bodies. She sighs. Oh, I know what I was trying to say. Later, Jolie describes the experience of being back there. I feel myself to be there. I see the mud around me. I smell it. Smell is very important. I smell it. I see the bodies, dead and alive. I'm there. I see all the details. I'm there. I'm very visual. I'm there. I see the sun or the rain. I feel the wet clothes. I'm there. She explains that she is 17 or 18 years old, a different self than now. I'm not here, she says. I don't even know myself now. I'm there. Somebody else talks out of me. You see, it's not me. It's that person who experienced, who is, experienced it who is talking. At age three and a half, Frida J. watched her father as he was dragged out of their apartment and taken to the main square of her ghetto to be hanged, and she and her family were forced to watch. When asked if she has an image in her head of her father being hanged, she replies, quote, oh no, it's not an image, it's a very real scene. Research is in cognitive psychology, and by the way, we're often wrong, uh, have proposed that memory is always dual. When you remember, you're experiencing a duality. That is, the individual experiences the present self being aware of the past self experiencing the world. I think that's how your memory works. Oh yeah, I remember the, the wedding of my sister and you go back in time, but you know you are the one going back in time and that back in time person is separate from the person who's remembering. However, with survivors of trauma, memory is not always dual. And that's important. Every so often the person goes within core memory and is back there. The past self is the present self. There, there's something that's actually just been recently discovered called late onset PTSD. And what is PTSD? Thank you. And it's, uh, I mean, we, we thought maybe it could happen 10 years later, 20 years later. It can happen 70 years later. A person can live a life, raise children, help with grandchildren, have a job, retire, and then experience full-blown symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and, and that's a problem, especially if they go back there. Suppose they're hospitalized, for instance, and there are people in uniforms that want to inject them, or, or they, they have these procedures, or they're you know, strapped down, uh, they're naturally not going to think they're in a hospital. They're going to think they're back there and that they're evil people trying to hurt them. The time-honored storage metaphor of memory, I think which many of us have, does not apply. For most of us, I want to, this is my view at least, memories are unavailable not because they're locked in a separate area of the mind, not because they're actively repressed, in the subconscious, but because they're in a format or a code, they're represented in a way that we cannot consciously experience. That neither linguistic nor perceptual, not, not in words, not in images. For most of us, long-term memories are present, we have them, they come out in dreams sometimes, but they're represented in abstract codes not comprehensible to our conscious selves. To convey these memories, we must actively search for them and then translate them into a form that we can consciously experience, usually words and images, sometimes music, um, and then communicate. That's the reason we're not constantly re-experiencing all of our memories. You know, imagine what it would be like in your life if all your long-term memories were active and accessible and in consciousness. 
They're, they're, they, they can't be. We wouldn't be able to live in the present. One problem haunting those who lived through the Holocaust and other widespread atrocities is that their long-term memories are not stored in abstract or inaccessible form. The memories are all too accessible to conscious experience in the form of perceptual images, emotions, and bodily sensations. And they're always there or easily roused by something in the world. During testimony, there are numerous instances when the recalling of a specific event produces sudden grief or anger. It's surprising to both the people recalling and to the people listening. The display of emotion is abrupt and unexpected until one realizes that the emotions are released with the disclosure of the specific episode in memory. Emotion is in the memory. When witnesses cry, for example, they're giving testimony, they're dressed up, they want to do a good job, they want to leave a record behind. When they cry, they often apologize. They didn't know they were going to cry, indicating that they're surprised by it, that they cannot control the pain of memory, that specific episodes are the source of emotion. Judith G. explains, quote, the scars are always there, but when you think about it, th there is a great emotional charge that carries forward. When the poet Theodore Retke wrote, we think by feeling what is there to know, he embraced both the concept of emotional representation and its primacy. Events in the world can tap directly into the well of core memories, unexpectedly, which can then pour into consciousness, which can then lead to reactions that are unavoidable and physical. Celia K. is clear about the extent and power of her memories. I'm not looking for it, it just automatically keeps coming to me. And somehow everything is vivid, very much alive, very much. She then relates a recent incident. A bonfire had been built uh, to burn some garbage in her backyard. Unfortunately, unexpectedly, the fire vividly retrieved the memory of her cousins who were burned alive in a small synagogue, which she saw. Quote, I became so hysterical, was screaming nonstop. I could not stop. I was screaming until my jaw came out. I could not put my jaw back in, and I could not control myself. She had to be restrained. This is half a century later. Selena R. talks of overwhelming emotion the one time she visited Auschwitz. Quote, there is one place that they collect hair and eyeglasses, some of you have been there, and I saw that mountain of glasses. My little brother wore glasses, and when I saw those glasses, I was hysterical. I was so hysterical, I just couldn't stop crying. Survivors are initially surprised by the emotion when they're talking about it, but after becoming aware of the connection between memory and what triggered it, they construct their own theories to account for the emotion. But these theories, these theories provide an explanation for them, but uh, they don't prevent the emotional flooding. I mean, I, I'm not a literary person. I'm not great with metaphor, but I, I think of tuning forks. I mean, you, you bang one tuning fork and another tuning fork of the same type will begin ringing because of the resonant frequency. How many have had physics? So it's as if some tuning fork has been banged and, and this other one starts vibrating from a distance. And you can have a theory, you can have a theory about resonant frequencies, but it's not going to stop this tuning fork from vibrating. The memories are going to pour forth. In addition, Holocaust memories affect the behavior and attitudes of survivors today in ways small and large. I'll ask for an answer. Martin S. says, I will always have my tank full of gas. And, and he explains, he talks, if it gets one-eighth below full, he goes to the gas station and fills it up, make sure it's full. Why? He's been doing this for decades. I'm sorry, I know this is abrupt. And uh, it takes... That's exactly what he said. Uh, he says, I'm always ready to run, yes. And, I mean, this is just one example. M many survivors have specific attitudes about food 
and uh, other things. So, so and, and it was pointed out to him finally, but he, it doesn't matter. And people who were ch children during the Holocaust um, will do things like buy uh, tens of thousands of dollars of presents, birthday presents for their children. I mean, they're, and I, I suppose the children don't mind, but, but it is, ab for most of us, abnormal behavior. They're, tr you know, they're trying to recover what they lost. Rene G. hid from the Nazis in a pit underneath a manure pile in order to survive. For 15 months, she was in this pit, no light. Uh, today, she needs open space. She keeps her office door open all the time, quote, ready to run. Her husband has an office without windows, and she never goes in. She's never gone in, no window. She stands by the door. Important questions remain. What does it mean when survivors say their memories are worse now? than they were before. The puzzled observer wonders how memories can be worse 50 years after the end of the war. I'll leave that and it's an open question for now. Um, what effect is there of having a set of personal memories that do not contribute to one's definition of self? With very young survivors, childhood is that self. Just as importantly, for a psychologist, what is the effect of integrating these anguished, shameful personal memories from the past? From a therapeutic perspective, does one adopt conventional strategies, which is what we like to do to promote fuller integration of the person? Uh, or does one encourage the different selves to remain separate? And again, because this is the University of Scranton and the Education for Justice program, and it's a good question, uh, is Holocaust memory sustainable? More generally, is memory for atrocity sustainable? So far, the answer is, it depends. It depends, first of all, on the meaning of sustainable and its application. Able to last or continue for a long time? Yes. Memories of atrocity are extravagantly durable. Using a resource so that it's not depleted or permanently damaged. The memory themselves, the memories themselves can be undepleted or undamaged for the lifetime of the person. But what about the individuals with the memories? To be more ele elemental, the word sustain, as you all know, has discordant overlapping meanings that create semantic tension, sustainable tension. Uh, one meaning, to keep in existence, to maintain. That's one definition of sustain. To experience or suffer is another definition of sustain. For example, to sustain a fatal head injury. And a third, to supply with necessities or nourishment. I, by the way, I got these, I should credit, from the American Heritage Dictionary, my favorite dictionary for those of you. Recommendations. Um, I actually used a dictionary. I don't know. Have you? I mean, the, the actual book. Um, it was to, to supply with necessities or nourishment. Hope sustained us. The first two seem clear. Memories maintain. Memories torment. The third demands more consideration. Is memory for atrocity sustainable in this third sense? Supplying necessities or nourishment? Uh, the answer depends on whether we're talking about individual or collective memory. I've mostly talked about individual memory. For collective memory, this is memory externalized and collected in movies, textbooks, museums, memorials, public stories, memoirs, archives of oral testimony. The answer is yes. For the Holocaust and to different extents, for other widespread atrocities, collective memory endures and sustains. But this was not always the case, just a little history. Early on, when Holocaust survivors tried to tell their horrors, the horrors they experienced, they mostly failed. They could not bridge the distance between their specific memories of extended suffering and our general schemas of normal existence. For example, one example, in the testimony of Max B, 
He conscientiously tells of his nine days inside a train transport, a cattle car, to Bergen-Belsen. This is a concentration camp. This is where Anne Frank died, which is the real end of the Anne Frank story. So, so he's, he's in a train, he's in a cattle car for nine days with nothing. And he tells how he moistened his parched, cracked lips with rags soaked in urine. How he became so desperately hungry that he cut the liver out of a corpse and ate it to keep from starving to death. When Max tried describing the suffering after the war, he says people would respond by saying, we had hard times too. We couldn't eat meat. We had to eat chicken. His conclusion in testimony is barely audible. No use to talk. After emigrating to the United States, the child survivor Martin S. talked about him, told his fellow students about enduring many months of slave labor, about his, the murder of his father, which he watched, a little game the guards played where he, his father was very sick. He had to walk a straight line, and they were shooting on either side of the line, and he finally fell off the line and got shot. Um, he told about Buchenwald. And he thought people were understanding. They listened. Until one day when things were quiet, a boy turned to Martin and said, why don't you tell one of your bullshit stories? Uh, Martin says from that day on, he did not say a word about the Holocaust for more than 30 years. Even at the time he gives testimony, much later, he does not like to talk about the Holocaust because he fears that he will, quote, lose credibility. Many other survivors expressed similar experiences shortly after the events. A single instance of reproach or misunderstanding discouraged survivors from talking, which is a lesson for all of us. Uh, memory could not collect. Today, the audience is different. It's far more acceptable and supportable and sustainable now in 2013 to give testimony than it was 20 years ago, around the time I think many of you were born. I believe 1993, marked by the movie Schindler's List, how many have seen Schindler's List? Important event. It's a, it's a landmark year. Since then, more than 100 theatrical films, not documentaries, but theatrical films have been made about the Holocaust, far more than the previous 45 years, with still more to come. The same pattern is true with other widespread atrocities. Uh, the deeply unsettling movie, The Act of Killing, came out this past summer. It's about the mass murder of more than half a million Indonesian people by the military dictatorship took place in 1965. I don't know, did it play in Scranton, the act of killing? Um, but th there was a theatrical film, The Year of Living Dangerously, which came out about 30 years ago, which covers the same material, but in a, with an entertainment film. Collective memory for atrocity is sustainable in every sense. Books provide biblio memory. Theatrical films, documentaries, TED Talks provide cinematic memory. Video recorded testimonies collected in archives are a resource for scholarship, but they're also a form of collective memory. In fact, I strongly encourage the construction of audiovisual archives of oral testimony with survivors of all other widespread atrocities. You give a face and a voice to people who otherwise would not be seen or heard, for victims and for perpetrators. For individual memory, the question remains, how sustainable is memory for atrocity? Given that memory consists of an extended sequence of discrete, deeply painful, Emotionally charged episodes, how is sustenance possible after so many years? Is there a reason to be optimistic? Some testimony. Abraham L., near the end of his testimony, long testimony. But worst of all, certain people, for some reason, certain figures is in you, in your brain. They stay with you, and they can't get away. They can't get away. They just can't get away. Anyone he sees the hole in his heart is getting, is not getting smaller, is getting bigger. And the Holocaust itself, I thought when years go by, these will, these will go away. It's getting closer. The Holocaust is getting nearer, not farer. 
It will never go away until the end of time, unquote. Consider the words of Leo G, half a century after the war. It's an ongoing thing. It never leaves you. You think years going on and you will finally lay things at rest? How do you escape it? It's individual memory. I could, I could stop there. Um, but a very different ending is also appropriate. That ending is too. Instead of escaping, some survivors return to their past self and tell their Holocaust memories in public. The child survivor and psychiatrist Robert K presents a symposium for high school students, still does it, every year. I should point out Robert K is not me. Um, although we look alike and we're roughly the same age, he's a different person. In his testimony, he asserts, nothing that I have ever heard from any psychiatrist or psychoanalyst in the world matches one 20 minute presentation by one of my survivor panelists in terms of their therapeutic well-being. He describes the survivor's revelations when speaking in public. Quote, they discover there are 500 students there who listen to them. And you should see the listening that goes on when they speak. And they see perhaps, perhaps they're doing something with their experience that some of those 500 will be touched by them to perhaps make even this much of a shift in their perception of life, their philosophy. That gives the survivor great hope. And I've seen them go through it and get depressed and break down and be in tears and stay depressed for two weeks and then tell me it was the best day of their lives. Unquote. With public disclosure, I want to make this important, the telling releases painful emotion but does not diminish it. Narrating the traumatic events does not provide meaning to the past suffering or to the memories. That's important. Change occurs in the function of memory. No longer meant to be hidden, memory is meant to be narrated, to educate and to document. Translating memories of atrocity into understandable narratives in public can give meaning and sustenance to the act of recalling, an act that pre previously provided only torment. In the blunt metaphoric words of Robert K, quote, it's turning shit into gold. That's my second ending and my last one. Thank you. I don't mean to pressure you. I know you have a busy life, each of you. Uh, but I am also here to answer or to try to answer questions. And uh, for those of you who have to leave, I think once again, you should feel free to walk out. For those of you who would like to stay, I hope that's some of you, and ask questions about this, I think, potentially controversial material, feel free to do so. I'm just going to stand here in front of you. I thought, you know. Yes, I think we, should, we could start. And, and can I get your name? Because this is the second time you've spoken. Harris? Yeah. Harris. Harris. Um, I was wondering where the traumatic experience occurred is similar to soldiers in World War II. They knew how to survive that as opposed to being prisoners of the country. Does that have a similar connotation to they were? Or how does that affect their survival? They, I'm, I'm going to repeat Harris's question, and I hope I do justice to it. Uh, what does this work have to say about soldiers? who have been through combat and have seen horrendous events and, and have lived through it repeatedly. Um, is that fair? Go ahead. Yeah, very fair. I was speaking specifically about World War II. About World War II uh, well, and seeing the camps and also some of them discovered that. Uh, the answer is there are similarities and differences. That uh, seeing something so alien to what you're prepared for, especially people who saw the camps or even seeing 
uh, bodies, parts of bodies, seeing friends <coughs> killed, uh, has the same effect uh, in terms of traumatic memory. That is, uh, it can deeply affect the person, the core memories can remain, and they can remain hidden. Sometimes until the, the former soldiers are in their early 80s. Often it does come out though, they, they begin to, to start talking. It's different in the sense uh, that they weren't betrayed by the people around them, most likely, that they were prepared, uh, that they had uh, meaning. I mean, it may be demolished in many respects, but they, at least they have meaning for why and what they're doing. And, and so we see less questioning of oneself, um, less kind of personal guilt and doubt, and there is survivor guilt, but we see just as much of the persistence of, of memory. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to, you know, professors do specialize in long answers to concise questions, uh, but my father fought in World War II, and um, it really wasn't until his early 80s, I'm not using him as the only example, that he started confessing things like he was afraid of thunderstorms because it reminded him of, of the bombs going off, and, and he started exhibiting more fears later in life. I think in part because the distractions are gone. You have to raise a family. You have a job. Then suddenly you're retired, the kids are gone, and the past can assert itself. I, I will, uh, the, pers the person to your right, I don't. Uh, I'm Emily, and do you think that something on a much smaller scale, like not necessarily war or the Holocaust or anything that big, but do you think that something that was for one person a really traumatic event, even if it was just they were a victim of violence or someone close to them or their family was, do you think that could have such a sustained, <coughs> like after all these years? Because I understand that people can have psychological and emotional trauma that yeah. lasts for a long time, but this is talking about like, you were saying like 70 years later, you can still have that PTSD. Right. Could something on a much smaller scale still be that pervasive that the, long after, or does it change depending on the magnitude of the event? You might not like this. The answer is yes and no. Uh, <laughs> because uh, that is like a, I'm sorry, I actually have a, I'll get to your, I have a cartoon from the New Yorker on my door. <coughs> it's, it's a prof professorial looking gentleman talking to a person at a cocktail party, and the caption is, in theory, yes, uh, Mrs. Wilkins, but also in theory, no. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not quite as wishy-washy as that. We have enough people who know about rape, about uh, witnessing the murder of a family member, about something uh, horrific uh, in psychology to be able to work with people. We don't have enough people who know about widespread atrocity. There's no reason why that particular event would not endure, left alone. Um, and also, you know, the, even survivors of the Holocaust, survivors of the R Rwandan genocide, who also studied, they didn't see the whole country. I mean, they saw their family, they saw the community, and so it's not as widespread as, as a continent or a country. And so in some sense, there's more similarity to an individual event. It's just that we're better off at dealing with it also, if it's not incest, which is actually a special case, because that involves betrayal by someone we love, which is separate, um, then we're able to make some sense of it. Okay. Not, that, not the event, but that it happened to you, um, and that that's, these are things that happen. So it's, it's not as serious, but the permanence of the imagery can, can be the same. Yeah, yes, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Mary. Mary. Um, when you were speaking about how the symptoms of PTSD can come out so much later in life, have you found relation with that and, um, like, the deterioration of the mind, like, natural deterioration that, yeah. are these uh, memories, like, more pervasive? Like, are those what last when other memories start to fade? I feel like writing down these questions. <laughs> that, that's a very perceptive an uh, question. The answer this time is... Um, pretty straightforward, the answer is yes. That in every case of late onset PTSD, uh, it's associated with some form of dementia. That it is the failure of this memory system that's been built up for 50 or 60 years 
to make sense of the world. And what's left is this very vivid past. So, so I'm sorry this is so, such a simple answer, but yes, it really does depend on uh, the breakdown of, of normal memory, probably through some kind of organic process. I'll just, I guess I'll move from stage left to stage right. Yeah, you are. I'm Tyler. And uh, so does that mean that our coping system with the world around us depends on the formation of new memories and when this holds, then we are constantly haunted? haunted by the, our old ones? Could you, I mean, that's, it made sense, but I didn't quite get it. That is, and it's my fault. Could you, that is, it sounded like uh, that we're making new memories and we have old ones, and what was the third part? I was just wondering if, the like, if we depend on the structure of new memories right. to cope with the world. And the loss of that causes us to be haunted by our old ones. That's accurate. Is, is that what, but that's not quite what you're asking, is it? Because uh, I'm going to, I'll answer it in a way and you can tell me if it's satisfying. Uh, one theory of emotion or of emotional disturbance is um, that the stronger the emotion is due to the discrepancy between our expectations and what actually happened. And to the extent uh, that we can make sense of it, the emotion dissipates. So if our new memories or our former memories can somehow make sense of whatever this traumatic set of episodes is, then it can help with the pain of that by lessening the discrepancy between at least what we expected at the time and what we realize is possible. But we, we do need knowledge and we do need a healthy memory system in order to be able to deal with our destructive memories. Is that, did I in any way touch? Yes, that's exactly right. That was just luck on my part then. <laughs> Please comment. condition where he can't create new memories um, and he's stuck at a certain point in, in time. And one of the things he says during the film is how can I heal if I can't mark time? It's one of his questions. Um, and I think that that's some, that speaks directly to the question that you were asking. Do we need to be able to mark time and create memory in order to deal with the painful emotional experience? Kind of thing? So, the answer in the movie is no. Right. Right. And by the way, that if you haven't seen Mementos 2001, Christopher Nolan does Batman now. Uh, <laughs> is a sup I mean, as a psychologist, I'm especially critical of psychological films. That is really perfectly, it, it is accurate. It is what happens to a person who loses the ability to form new memories. Of course, there's a story, but I, I recommend Memento. And I think it's as entertaining today as it, would, it was 12 years ago it came out. Thank you. I'm the gentleman in back, and then... Um, I was very intrigued by your comments about Schindler's List, and I just heard some comment on NPR or something that someone was critiquing it because it was the story of those who survived and not those who perished. Yeah. Um, the communal memory, the social memory for many of us is based on the movies, or maybe something like Mila 18 by Leon Uris. Our experience of this is least one step removed and I'm sure you know you can critique right. the movies and the novels about or even the Diary of Van Frank movie which I saw before I read the book as a kid. For your, uh, would you call these patients or clients or the persons you've interrogated? I, I call them witnesses. Witnesses, okay, the witnesses. Do witnesses find these things helpful? Are they, um, you know, it, I was haunted by your comment about the kid who said to the kid, you know, tell us all your bullshit stories. Right. Uh, just your thoughts on how the movies interact with this whole thing. I, I have two comments, and, and if I f forget the second, please remind me. That uh, I, I think we're fortunate in that in some historic events, uh, I mean the recent movie Lincoln, which has a few mistakes in it, in some historic events, that we have one film. 
and, that and that's what we know about the emperor of China in a particular dynasty. Uh, with the Holocaust, we have something like 150 films, so we're able uh, to abstract out some, some kind of historical truth from it, so that, that's fortunate. Second, yes, the landmark films, there was a pretty bad but landmark TV movie in 1978 called Holocaust, uh, which actually marked uh, the first time we, we really talked about this. And then there was Schindler's List that came out in the theaters in 93, and then it was broadcast, I don't know if anybody remembers, it was broadcast on television without commercials. It was quite an event in 1997, uh, and more people saw it, and 60 million people in this country watched the film. I noticed, because I studied testimonies over a period of time, the witnesses referring to these movies. They, re they refer to the sorrow and the pity, um, they refer to Night and Fog, these are earlier movies, but then they started referring to Schindler's List and one person was a Schindler Jew, as he called himself. So, in general, uh, even though it was Spielbergian and there was a redemptive ending, it's still accurate, even though not representative, people refer to, to that film and to other films as a way of trying to communicate their experiences. Uh, I found, and of course it's not everyone, no complaints. Even with the controversial, I don't know if you know, that Life is Beautiful with Roberto Benigni, which was kind of a comedy, uh, but, but, but with pathos. Uh, even that film is referred to not by critics or scholars, but by the survivors themselves as something helpful. Uh, oh, I, and, and I'm so sorry because I was going to call the young woman in front. I'm sorry, that was, I was a gender, but the young person in front. <laughs> Thank you. I just like, I'm just focusing on the young. <laughs> so um, I, I really want to thank you very much for this um, insightful lecture and to tell you, to share with you that I am a child of two Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And um, you have, your lecture evoked a very powerful memory in me, um, and I'm going to have to process all that, about when, um, as, as children in our home, when somebody got up and they're caught in the door, my parents or my mother would just start screaming and um, you call every single time um, that that happened she would call the, the Nazis who did that for support at night in the camps they would just randomly throw someone in just you know, take their hand and torment them yeah. yeah so uh, and you know what I have actually um, transferred that memory into mm -hmm. my children which is unfortunate <laughs> but see that's how memory works also because I have uh, assumed a lot of my, pa of my parents memories and there's such a thing as cellular memory also. There have been a lot of studies on Holocaust survivors and their children mm -hmm. about their, their biological differences, their mm -hmm. higher cortisol levels, their mm -hmm. higher yeah. vigilance. So you have a trauma actually changes the body emotionally, yeah. psychologically, and physiologically. And it's important to know that. You know, that you can't integrate, but some traumas you can never integrate. They actually change and it lives on for generations. It changes the human psyche and uh, as well as, as the body. I, I, I won't even attempt to elaborate on that eloquence, um, it, except, well, yeah, to, to say that, I mean, yeah, it, it's not just your parents' trauma, it's not just yours, it's, it's your children's. Right. And, I guess, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to be pessimistic, but th the fact is the poison was the Holocaust. In fact, and, and so that's the poison. And it works its way down through the generations. And no amount of talking about how some people can be helped can undo both what you talk about, the physiological propensity kind of to have PTSD as a child of, of a survivor. I mean kind of to be agitated, to have too much cortisol, is that, right. um, that, that, it's not, I want to make it clear, it's not you, it's not your parents, it's the destructiveness of the events, ultimately yeah, responsible. That's, that's what happens to evil, but on the flip side, when goodness happens, it also gets transferred to them, people are not aware of it, and if somebody does a wonderful deed and saves people, it's, you know, there, there is that feeling, there must be. Yeah.
I think most of you who know psychology know that, I mean, positive psychology, it took 120 years of, of looking at the sicknesses to then make us realize, oh, maybe we should look at what makes us feel better. That's happened maybe for 15 years. So we're way behind yeah. in that. But just to comment on that, survivors do comment, I don't know how it affects their children, on kindnesses, very small kindnesses uh, that they remember just as long as, um, not maybe not the same way, but just as long as the pain. Right. Nobody really will, will understand it, but that's worse than actually talking about it. Yeah, and uh, it's not surprising to me. It's you know, there's both there are a lot of people, but it's it's somewhat anonymous, and it's the context is right. Right. Exactly. And I appreciate your comments, by the way. Sorry, I made you wait so long. All right, oh, uh, uh, there's, there's conflict here. I'm going to do two more. I see two more hands, uh, and I will not be lengthy. This, is, this would be a precedent. Did, I'm sorry, what, were there hands? Yes. Oh, the gentleman in back, I'm being uh, gender Thank specific. You. I wasn't going to ask the question until she gave me permission to go ahead and ask. saying that we should continue the conversation. And I'm just wondering, I know you're coming at this from the point of view of psychology, but looking at the cultures of different people around the world, people who have experienced these atrocities, is a culture that values memory and, and a, a religious system that almost that does value memory. Does that in any way kind of mediate or maybe even makes more damaging the experience itself. It affects the responses to it and the you know, transmission of it. I'm talking about the writing of books, creation of film, um, po possibly even the psychological responses. I don't think it, it damages it, but you've made a, a particular point. Um, I said I'd be brief, but there was a group known as the Gypsies, now known as the Roma, in Europe, uh, half a million of them were targeted and killed during the Holocaust. We don't hear very much about that. It's not a culture that writes books. It's not a culture that wants to, I mean, I'm speaking, I know I'm making a generalization, that wants to integrate with the rest of Europe, at least not until recently. And so that does affect uh, what we know, and it affects what their children and what their grandchildren go through. So yes, um, I think yes and no, culture affects responses, but I think there is an underlying commonality across all people. There's only so much people can do. Uh, humans can respond to this kind of pain. And I think there's a commonality across all these people and differences in how it's talked about and maybe even um, dealt with individually. I don't know if I answered your question. And, and we, yes, more literate cultures, uh, more cultures that, and religions that depend on memory as their basis, I think actually have an advantage, at least in terms of establishing collective memory. And one more. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, I didn't know, uh, is that olive and brown? Is it? Yeah. All right, I, I'll refer to clothing now. Uh, the second Mary. Um, do you have any, um, and given your experience of speaking with so many witnesses, and since the theme for this presentation was sustainable memory, you mentioned you know, there's individual you know, communal memory, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, I believe it was back in 2011, um, they were, um, trying to, to make some design changes to the, um, the, uh, the museum at Auschwitz. Right. And there's a lot of controversy about what to do, what, you know, what, what would be right. appropriate, because there were so many different communal memories of what right. that place meant. And I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. 
I probably do. I'll try to keep them quick. First of all, there's always going to be controversy. Uh, not just about that, but like Robben Island in South Africa. I mean, there, there are different sites that are sacred where people have suffered. Uh, and I mean, one tension is, do you keep it up? Do you preserve it? Do you kind of amusement park it? Or do you just let it decay as, as it might normally decay? And, and so that, that's a controversy um, because most of these places would then be gone. I, I don't have a position on it. I mean, I do, I don't really, I think it depends on the purpose of the memorial. Um, and uh, places were like, some, yeah. For some people, the purpose of it was it, it, it's, it's a cemetery. <coughs> yeah. For other people, it's an educational right. vehicle. And I, that's where, and I mean, there were other issues too, which had to do with it. Just, it really depends on the function. Yeah. And it's multifunctional. Yeah. For instance, the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum um, that there will not be that controversy. It's, it's built to create an experience, maybe a three or four hour experience for people and it will be maintained to do that. It's off site. I think Yad Vashem, I've been, how many been to the Israeli and, uh, museum? It's, um, I think it's built to recreate the experience and to educate, but it's also off site. So it's, it's only the on site yeah. memorials where there's controversy and that's about all I'll I can say, uh, other than it was a good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, what do we do? Um, oh, that was a general question. Here's one thing we should do. Uh, I'm going to say thank you very much <laughs> for your attention. And really, I think you should feel comfortable leaving now. <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to stay here for individuals who want to walk up, and, and I'll get down at your level, uh, who want to walk up and talk or introduce yourself. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for what I consider to be devoted attention and superb, and I hope memorable, <laughs> stealable questions. <laughs> thank you.